Hey guys, it's Nigel Lee from Sax School. So, on my journey to find a new tenor saxophone, I've been testing out all sorts of instruments. You may have seen my other reviews where I'm testing out the Selma SBA versus the Reference 36, the Yanagisawa horns, and even this Trevor James Custom Raw. Now, Trevor James are awesome. They're a local British company, and they sent me up this saxophone just to test for a couple of weeks. I gotta say, it's been blowing my mind. This is not a massively expensive saxophone, but it plays so well, and that's probably why so many real high-level players are using this saxophone at the moment. But I wanted to find out why this saxophone works so well, why it sounds so good. So I have reached out to David Farley, who is the chief technical saxophone wizard guy over at uh, Trevor James, to find out a bit more. And I asked him what the backstory was with this saxophone. The, the, the company really started about 40 years ago now, and it, it, was a, it was a happy accident where Trevor met with a Taiwanese flute maker uh, who had a factory at the time. And they, they worked together. Um, Trevor set up a, 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 a workshop over here in the UK and flute so, soon turned to saxophones. And we started exploring that market because it was new and exciting and we thought we had something to offer. And uh, as such, we kind of always had this ability to be able to filter and work at a technical level with these instruments. And inevitably, the success of our original instruments, our classic altos, um, led on to step-up models. What can we do? We have step-up flutes. Do we need a step-up saxophone? So we decided to start looking at what makes saxophones desirable, really. And rather than go down perhaps a, a homage route, shall we say, we decided to see what we could find out ourselves by talking to people that we felt mattered, which were the players, of course. And along the way, being so technically orientated, we actually wanted to talk to technicians too, because those are the people who, whose pool of information and knowledge can help you to create what you need. And of course, it's taken maybe now 20 years, probably, to get to this stage. Um, nine years in earnest, I suppose, the last nine years. But it's really um, a tribute to everybody who's contributed to this project, which are all the important people. Yes, yeah, so it's a long process. I mean, I've, I've known about Trevor James flutes and so student model instruments for a long time. And yeah. great, you know, great. Uh, but I'm also, I've been hearing so many things about this. So through Sax School, uh, guys like Steve Cole, uh, Andy yeah, Smith, yeah. uh, Jeff yeah. Cashua, I know they're all playing on one of these. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, and they're... Every time I talk to them, they're raving about how great they are. So, yeah, I mean, it's just wonderful. That's a wonderful testament to all that development that you've been doing, David. Absolutely. Thank you, Nigel. Thank you. I mean, it's really humbling to see so many great players actually sort of working with you and excited about a project. And, and I think that excitement, that passion is really the future of what we're all doing. I mean, we play these things to express ourselves, and if we can't do that in manufacture as well, then I think it's a bit sad, really. So yeah, I, well, I embrace it all, you know? I really that's do. brilliant, that's brilliant. I'm, uh, so I was, uh, it was interesting for me when, when cause you, it's wonderful that you sent this horn up for me to try. I've got to give it yeah. back, reluctantly. <laughs> okay. but, uh, but I was really curious to test it out when it first arrived. And the first thing that struck me, there's two things that struck me, actually, as soon as I pulled it out the beautifully packaged box, by the way, Thank is uh, the, the sound of it is so dark and fat. I love the sound and creamy. And also the, the way the instrument is set up is amazing. It's so well set up. Everything just seals right down the bottom. I can play pianissimo, B flats, and all the way up into the altissimo, it's in tune. It just, it feels really great under my fingers. And hey, there's plenty of, brand new saxophones out the box at any price range that don't necessarily feel like that. So it really, it really impressed me. But I was curious to know the sound, what sort of weird alchemy are you doing there? Because it sounds great, it sounds <laughs> well, like an old one. Yeah, I mean, it's taken a long time. Um, the, the reason this instrument's called the Roar is because we wanted it to be no frills. We don't want gimmicks. We don't want anything on there that can constitute anything that could be seen to be improving it. The, the, the actual design of this instrument has stood the test of time for a long time. And therefore, we start looking at what makes the sound work. 
it doesn't involve anything you can see, but it's to do with the alloys and it's to do with the bore and it's to do with developing the scale and everything that we've done under the bonnet of the saxophone for years. We've, we've been constantly thrown all sorts of wonderful ideas. Mornington Lockett, I've spent so much time with Mornington talking about super foot thirteenths and all sorts of things, and basically trying to work out how this scale can be improved, how we can move it forward. So, so much of it is not open to being obvious when you look at the instrument. So the, the alloy for a start has taken us nine years to get this particular brass alloy. And that's maybe wow. 15 different versions of alloys. So not all brass is created equal. Okay. Um, it, it, it's quite a heavy saxophone too. Yeah, I, yeah. I know that. You know, probably, it, yeah. in fact, I was, I was testing a, a solid silver Yanagasawa, which is a, a heavy yeah. instrument. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. It, actually, I've been playing this Dave Guadala tenor for 25 years, and that's quite a heavy instrument. But this yeah. is similar weight to that. So it's it noticeably yeah. heavier than like a yeah. new Selma or a... Uh, you know, most yeah, it, it, it's 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 um, the brass is giving the sound that we're looking for. So um, the the weight side of it, it's not, we we haven't found it to be unnecessarily weighty. We've worked with silver before, but what we are working with is quality brass. I mean, really sonically quality brass, and that comes with a slight increase in weight. Um, hopefully, I don't, think, I don't think that. Yeah, I don't think the weight is an issue. I mean. Mm. I, I don't, it doesn't affect me when I'm playing. I just, when I picked it up, I thought, oh, that's interesting. Yep. A hefty piece of kit. Substantial. <laughs> Substantial. That's a good word to use. Definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so that's interesting. So it's all about the, the material that's made from and then Absolutely. the sort of the design that's yeah. making the sound. And when you say yeah. it's the raw, the ethos of the raw model is that it's stripped back. So there's no gimmicky things. Are you talking about, um, Keywork things, you're talking about lacquer, finishes, what? Well, what, I'm, what we're really talking about here is, is, is not trying to make the instrument appeal uh, from an eye candy point of view necessarily. Um, in other words, we're trying to move away from a safe zone and, and explore what really matters in a horn. So what, what, what you won't see necessarily is all sorts of fancy engraving or anything which is kind of superfluous to the message we're trying to put across which is by working all of us together we can produce something that sax would have been really happy to know exists today and, uh, I quite like that. yeah i like the idea of that so it's about it's about how it plays and how it sounds that's absolutely really, yeah, first and really, foremost first and foremost yeah really yeah. cool and then the so, feel of the instrument has been, uh, the, you know, the, the second level is really how the whole instrument feels as a player, how familiar it is. And of course, we've been down a long journey of looking into vintage horns and how they feel, how they fit under the fingers, the ergonomics of everything. Because it's been an interesting journey to find um, vintage players willing to look at new instruments and, and new incarnations of what they hold dear. And therefore, the ergonomics have been the, uh, a, a, a tricky thing too, which you don't appreciate how long it takes to get somewhere with everybody's opinions, you know. Yeah, I can, well, I can imagine it actually. I've always <laughs> been, I've always been a fan of modern horns, and mostly because, by well, two reasons. Firstly, classic horns were way too expensive for me back when I was starting out, and and secondly, I like the reliability of a modern horn because I want to work a work horn, an instrument that I could be playing constantly that wasn't going to cause me lots of hassle. And so I've always played a modern horn. And so for me, the transition, you know, I'm, I'm open to these sorts of things. And in fact, if anything, I find some vintage horns problematic for me. But uh, yeah, you're right. There's a lot of people who are super dedicated to their absolutely. FBA or their Mark Abs and Absolutely. Something else. And, and, and what I find so wonderful is that in looking into all of these vintage instruments, these wonderful things, there are, there is, there are small elements of performance that, we've, that have been forgotten, but you can find them on these instruments and use them in the modern idiom to actually do what they were designed to do, which was to give better sound. But I have to say, even after this length of journey, there are some SBAs out there I would kill for the sound of. And there are other vintage horns out there that I can take or leave. But the thing is that that, that sort of, that sort of um, inconsistency is almost part and parcel of the whole, yeah, the, the, whole, yeah. the whole journey. 
Yeah, no, very, very interesting, David. And uh, you're definitely, to me anyway, capturing, you're capturing that vintage sound in this. This is, an, yeah. for me, I find it really interesting that it's a mix between the vintage sound and a more, and a modern mechanism. Yeah, uh, definitely. And uh, I, I find it interesting when I pick up a different saxophone and start playing at where the sound leads me because I guess, I don't know, you, I'm inspired by the sound that's coming out of the saxophone. And that's why I played that Godala for years, even though there's yeah. stuff I really struggle with it. I love the sound of it. But what I did find with this is it just makes me want to play in a meaty, you know, <laughs> gutsy sort of sound. I was even testing it by playing through some classical uh, etudes and things just to see yeah, what yeah. the mechanism was like. And even when I was playing that, I found myself wanting to go bluesy and meaty. It's just got such a wonderful, yeah. wonderful big fat sound on it. Yeah. yeah, well, that, that, that's a wonderful thing to hear, Nigel, because it's, it really is down to that core sound. If the core sound isn't there and that, that, that willingness to want to not put it down, then is it worth pursuing the project, really, from a, from a credible point of view? So that's why all that time has been spent trying to give that sound to you. Um, yeah. And then, then, then if you've got all of that, why are you going to throw it together in a haphazard way as far as building the instrument is concerned? It's just be, beyond me. So we yeah. spend an awful lot of time looking at pivot screws and working with Steve Howard and everybody on trying to nail exactly how to maximize this whole package into something which is reliable and sounds great and feels great. And there we are. The important thing for me is that the build quality of this horn is, is very important. We only use the best Pisoni pads, best springs, best everything. They're all of the pivot screws are stainless steel. They're all pointed rather than there's no, there's no pseudo points in there anymore or anything else. And I've actually developed a new receiver inside all of the keywork, which gives zero tolerance movement. They're virtually oil free because of the, because of the way they work. And in doing that, we can then pad the instrument effectively, make sure the tone holes are as flat as possible to give the best seal. And hopefully it's, a, it's like a flute made of brass, really. That's what we're trying to do. Something exact yeah. and, and spot on. That's why the mechanism feels so accurate uh, when you're playing it. It feels very positive. Good. And also, I guess that's going to mean that it's going to stay in regulation Absolutely. for a long time. Yeah. Absolutely. Exactly. Yeah. And of course, being that we're here in the UK, uh, we're, I mean, we, this is a project which is, which is moving forward. Uh, we, we, are, we make hundreds of these a year, not thousands of them, and that's for the rest of the world. They're all hand-built here in Lenham, down in Kent, and any information we get, any feedback, any, anything we can do to make this project better, we are, we are all ears, basically. We have very strong social media, uh, so please, uh, as part of a family of, of, of Signature Custom, please feel free to, to make contact, give advice, give help, be part of the family. That's what, that's what we're asking. Love it. Love it. Nice to see a British uh, manufacturer making, making saxophones that are Thank amazing. You. Awesome. Wasn't that an interesting conversation? I think David's an interesting fella and it's really inspiring to see a British company that are really making amazing progress with, I think, a world-class saxophone. It's really inspiring, actually. And I love to hear all those things you were saying about the developmental process, how it's so long, how they're looking in so much detail, all those little elements and refining all the way along to produce a saxophone like that. And I guess that's how you end up with something that's so amazing. So I hope you found that helpful. Let me know in a comment what you think if you've tried a saxophone like this. Also, let me know if there's some other saxophones you think that I should check out and find out a bit more about because I think this process of exploring and finding a new saxophone is a really interesting one. Hey, as always, if you're new here, don't forget to click subscribe, hit the bell notification so you find out about future videos. And if you want to develop your saxophone skills, come and join us over at Sax School. You can get a 14-day trial right now. And we've got thousands of students using our huge range of lessons and courses. And, you know, as a member, you'll be part of that massive worldwide community and get instant help from myself and my team of tutors as well. So together, we can help you to make amazing progress on your saxophone as well. So whatever you're up to, keep practicing hard, and I'll catch you next time.